announcements uh, are brief this morning. Um, one is I received a reminder that we do have the two red bins that have not been collecting any items in the last few months. So if we can continue to do so and start next week and start filling out those containers, especially since during the holidays we know a lot of people go without. So it's really important that we contribute to our community. Um, and then before we do any more, uh, well, let me cover some more. Uh, the office will be closed Thursday and Friday, so don't be calling them, because I'm not going to answer unless it's an emergency. Obviously, I'll answer the phone. Uh, two, Don and Eileen will be uh, decorating today Wabi Hall, so if you have nothing else to do afterwards, join them. Uh, Friday morning as well, they'll be here decorating the sanctuary, preparing it for Advent. So if you're not up for helping today, help them out Friday. Donna will make sure that she covers you for coffee and Wabi Ha. <laughs> uh, and then maybe you all can help decorate the office because, you know, you've got three guys in there who don't really have a lot of decoration. Um, if you see my office, if you walked in earlier, you saw my decoration, which was the tree and the lights. <laughs> so, if you're inclined to decorate in the office, do so. Uh, and if not, that's okay as long as we're decorated up here. Uh, for prayer, I'll include that during our opening prayer. Don't forget, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. And if you brought your pledges because you haven't submitted them, today is your deadline. And I'm told that the church the little church <laughs> is back there in the North Six for you to deposit your pledges. And um, Eileen will be coming up to share an announcement with you. Okay, I wanted to give everyone an update on what the search committee has been up to. Um, believe me, we have been meeting feverishly every other week, even while Scott was in Florida. We had a meeting <laughs> with Scott in Florida. Um, it's quite a process now. We haven't had to look for a minister in over 30 years because all of our associate ministers just walked into the, not walked into the job, but you know, went into the job. So um, we had to put together a whole profile that was submitted maybe about a month ago um, and with that submission we also put out that survey that many of you have been asking about we are using that survey to help us find a person that is like this person over here um, pastor gilbert is in the role of designated term as we have discussed before um, the title designated term uh, was used for him because he was not ordained at the time um, if he had been ordained, the term would have been interim. And an interim mis minister is just what it says, an interim minister, and they are here to take you from one settled pastor to another settled pastor. Um, as a designated minister, um, however, and, and let me back up a second, an interim minister should not become a settled minister. That's kind of like the rules that they have. However, a designated term minister can. Um, we checked with the conference and we asked if um, the job could be offered to Gilbert. But Gilbert has declined our offer. Um, he will elaborate that himself. Um, I, I asked him what he would like uh, us to say, but I, I wanted to let everyone know that he has declined. And we do have a candidate. Um, we are in the process of trying to set up an interview now. Um, Scott is being is in contact with this person. And because it's the holidays, again, just like last year when we went through this, um, it's more difficult to get somebody to come in for an interview. And we're, we're gonna start with a Zoom interview and then hopefully very, very quickly after that have an in-person interview and have them come and preach for us. Uh, because we want everyone here to see this person, as we did with Gilbert. Um, and at Gilbert's su suggestion, when we do have this person come in, if it goes that far, of course we have to go through the interview process, 
Um, he suggests that we take a vote that day. You know, take uh, in, take your opinions of the person that comes in. Um, he thinks that would be in, uh, immediate feedback, and we have a better idea as to whether we should make an offer to this person. So, if you have any questions, number one about Gilbert, he will answer those questions himself. Number two about the survey, if you have any questions about the survey, please email Scott, and I think it's Scott Podger at Gmail, but he's in the book. <laughs> um, but if you have any other questions about our search, you can reach out to any one of the um, committee members. Jan is here, I see Elaine is here, I am here, and Bob's upstairs. Um, Scott, you can always reach out to him by um, email or call. You can call or text him as well. But does anybody have any immediate questions? Nope. And I just want to be the first person, see, now it's gonna happen, um, to thank this guy over here because he's done everything we asked, everything, so. One last thing I want you to know that he has told me, and he's told all of us, that he will do everything in his power to help us transition to a new minister. Everything. So, track. I, I got so far to it. I know that. Is it on? Yeah. I know that this was a difficult announcement for the search committee to share with you, um, but. It's like I told the search committee, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't make an honest assessment of where you're at and where I'm at, and if we're a good fit long term. And on top of that, as Eileen mentioned, had I been called as an interim, this wouldn't even be a conversation. And that's why a lot of the work that I've done, I focus on interim work. Some of it, you know, I explained some of it was, I'm gonna do it because this is what I'm asked to do. And it ruffles some feathers. And that's part of the interim process, is we ruffle feathers, right? Um, and it's to get you from, as she said, from one set of passage to another, but it's also to get you from point A to point B. And one of the main goals that the search committee had asked was that I push the congregation to, with technology. And I've done that. We've also put new practices into the office to where that's running a little smoother. Uh, I know Kyle has been grac gracefully reminded several times. I'm like, Kyle, this is our new practice. So he was used to doing things a certain way for so many years. And so it's reminding him. So now that we have the full staff on board, Riley and Kyle, they have already been informed on the transition that's gonna happen. Which means that Riley's getting a lot of training before my last day on my contract, which is January 31st. With that being said, both Kyle and Riley, along with Bob, would have my personal contact information in case that there's any questions on work that we started or how to do something. The rest of the congregation will not be provided with that information because of boundaries. Once I finish my contract here, that's it. There's no communication going forward with the congregation. The other thing is that, as Eileen mentioned, I did offer the search committee to help with the transition. What that means is, if for some reason, by the time my last day comes, they don't have, or you all have not called a pastor, a settled pastor, then I will sit down with them probably a couple of weeks in advance and lay out pulpit supply so that you're not stressing as a congregation and they're not stressing as a search committee trying to balance so many things. And Riley will just ensure that that person is going to come in. He'll have a list that if, let's say, Donna was pulpit supply and she's like, you know what, an emergency came up, I can't make it, Riley will then call. If it's after hours, of course, that'll go to Bob as council president to handle that. But they'll be giving that information, okay? Um, the other thing, as Eileen said, 
What I did recommend as well, which does happen in other congregations when there's a search, is the either designated or interim pastor will step aside for a Sunday and have that candidate come and preach. So I wouldn't be present because of boundaries once again. So if a search committee says, hey, pastor, uh, we have a candidate, they're going to be here December, whatever. I told them, as long as it's not Christmas, we're good. <laughs> so let's say it's in December, they give me a Sunday, I know that I'm not going to be preaching, and they're the ones that are going to provide some of the information for that Sunday. That way, as soon as that person is done, the other suggestion that I made was, and I know two folks in the back who are familiar with this process, um, let's say Hannah, because she's not a member, she's a, a staffer, let's say she's here that day, right? You all are voting bodies, right? So you have to be in the sanctuary. Hannah would then escort that candidate out to the lounge or Wabi Hall, entertain them so you can dance and, no, I just give <laughs> So she'll keep them company while you, and at that point, he will then call to order to take a vote, okay? Of course, at that time, you can discuss any brief questions that the search committee would be able to provide for you, but at the end result would be that you would take a vote. And of course, like always, most places, majority rules, right? So at that point, if you were to say, yes, we want this person to be our settled pastor, then Hannah would be notified, she escorts the and as such, I will do as much as possible, within reason of course, right, to help you, okay? Um, other than that, if you have any particular questions, you can ask me outside in the fellowship hall, or if you wanna make an appointment, we can talk about it. Um, but at this point, I would just continue to ask that you support your search committee in the process that they're taking, because all the questions that they had to answer took weeks because it averages out to about 20 pages that then a candidate will read about your congregation, okay? And that's to give them as much background information as possible. So, any immediate questions? Okay. Prayers for Deborah Carstens. Uh, it's Barb's friend who is having back and leg pain, so prayers for her. Uh, prayers for Kate Kramer, Eileen's mom, who was in the hospital, but she's home now, recovering, so we continue to pray for her so that she can fully heal. Uh, we know she has a personal nurse, so there won't be a problem there, right? Uh, the other one is for my friend who lost her daughter uh, a little bit over a week ago. She's having surgery on Tuesday, so prayers for her as well as she grieves and as she goes into the surgery. And as many of you know who have email, uh, or maybe you already talked to somebody, is that um, Arlene Arthur passed yesterday, late afternoon in the early evening. Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited into that sacred space to be there with her children. And so once that came about, you know, before it happened, I was there. Um, and as you know, Saturday Sabbath, but I also tell you, if it's an emergency, my Sabbath kind of takes pause because this was really important. And honestly, I was blessed to be there for her sacred moment in transition. We did a prayer service, gave her an anointing with uh, uh, holy oil that I brought from the Holy Land. So she received that, and a few moments later, uh, she passed. Um, her son and her daughter were there at her side, holding her hand as she transitioned. Um, and I was there until they left the hospital. Funeral arrangements will be coming from uh, Hills, so whenever the family contacts them, you know, obviously then Graham or somebody in his staff will call me and let me know the final details of the family. And as those come in, then I'll share them with you via email. So if you don't have email, that's okay. I'm not shaming you for that. Um, just make sure you call somebody during the week, say, hey, did we get an email? Uh, and I know some of you have those connections, right? So it's just, you share the information, right? In case that you want to attend. We don't know for sure um, if the service will be here or if her wishes were to have it at the funeral home. Uh, her kids were gonna look for that information and see what's best, right? Um, so depending where it is, then you know, I'll let you know. 
Um, she was shy about two months of her 90th birthday. So we know that the holidays, when someone passes, it's difficult during the year, right? But we know the holidays that take that extra sting to your life and to your grieving process. So I ask you that you help uplift them by prayer because, you know, when we lose a loved one, our selfishness as human beings, we don't want that person to leave us, right? We want them to be next to us. We don't want them to go. We want to cherish those memories. And you all have been there at one point in your life or another of losing a loved one. So I know that a lot of you know that feeling, and some of you more recently. And it's an unfortunate part of our life benefit of that is that we leave to our eternal home, and that's with Arlene Isma. But we have the cycle of life, and we have Maximilian <laughs> here. So it's a reminder that life continues, right? And we gotta continue that love and the compassion that we're taught unto others so that it can continue. So today, we light that candle in memory of Arlene and everything that she did for her family, her friends, her church community. And my understanding is she was part of this community for her whole life. So I know that that was important. And so It's difficult when you're there because there's nothing you can do as pastors, right? Just like a nurse, you do what you can, right? The nurse yesterday, her kid said thank you, and he's like, well, I just did what I could, which was basically keep her comfortable, right? As pastors, there's nothing we can do. Those of you who have lost a loved one, you know I told you there's nothing I can do or say to make you feel better, right? Sometimes it's just being in that space with you and just holding you. And at the end of the day, if you reach out to her kids, awesome. And if you don't, spiritually hold them, hold them up, hold their hands spiritually and ask God to just be there with them. Let us pray. We sing a song of thanksgiving today. Dear God, one and many, we pause in the midst of all that is unholy, unthinkable, undeniable, to look within and offer our gratitude for a day that has dawned in you and for the breath that gives us life. We rejoice that we have voice and head and heart so that we can love one another, love you, and love all your people. We celebrate the abundance in our lives and that we can share with the world in jubilance and grace. We offer ourselves in all that we are and have to be your justice and peace in the midst of all that is unholy, unthinkable, undeniable. In the name of Jesus, we now enter into silent prayer. Please join me in the call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We glorify our God with songs of thanksgiving and joy. God has sent, God has done great things for us, filling us with grace. God fed our ancestors in the wilderness. God clothes us with hope. We will offer our hearts to God, always saying thank you to the one who loves us. We will sing our praises, shouting of God's presence in our lives.
join me in the prayer of reconciliation. Because we live in this modern, tech-driven, twittering age, we often forget what you have done for us, God of every blessing. We pat ourselves on the back for our ability to learn new computer skills, but have forgotten that life is more than a machine. We have more than we could ever use, yet life squirrels store up more and more. Our faith is often pushed to the back of the closet to make room for all the fears we wear so easily. Forgive us, restorer of life, as you clothe us with your grace and mercy. May we share with those who have so little. As our hearts overflow with your love and wonder, may we offer them as gifts to everyone we meet. As you feed us with your joy and hope, may we welcome to the table all those whose lives are filled with tears and pain. As we gather with family and friends during this season, may we continue to give thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Take a moment for silent confession. Amen. Hear God's assurance of grace. This is the good news. As God dresses creation in wonder, so you will be clothed in grace. As God pours out abundance upon the earth, so you will be blessed with peace and joy. We don't say it often enough, but thanks be to God for healing, for life, for wonder, for mercy. We are blessed, for we are forgiven. Amen. I now invite you to stand in body or spirit and share a sign of peace by waving to each other. given to me as a gift of gospel tunes and for some reason I decided I was going to master every song in here. Uh, occasionally though as Han and I were talking about this morning one song seems to jump off the page for me and that was this song it's called My Desire and it was written by Thomas Dorsey not that Tommy Dorsey another Tommy Dorsey. <laughs> It's my desire to do some good thing every day. It's my desire to help the fallen by the way. It's my desire to bring back those who've gone astray. It's my desire to be like the Lord. It's my desire 
to bring some wanderer to the fold. It's my desire to shelter someone from the cold. It's my desire to do his will as I am told. It's my desire to be like the Lord. It's my desire to teach some sinner how to pray. It's my desire to help some traveler find the way. It's my desire to lift up Jesus every day. It's my desire to live like the Lord. It's my desire to see his face when life is done. It's my desire to meet the Father and the Son. It's my desire to hear him say, my child, well done. It's my desire to be like the Lord. Our first reading is from Joel, chapter 2, verses 21 through 27. Do not fear, O soil. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, you animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other and my people shall never again be put to shame. The word of God for the people of God, amen. Our second reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings should be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all, this was attested at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Please stand in body and spirit for our gospel reading according to Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 through 33. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here is our gospel lesson. Let us not place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. There's a story about this neighborhood. There was this man, pretty wealthy, pretty well off. Excuse me. <laughs> no, he didn't sneeze, thank you. <laughs> and he had two neighbors inside of him. One, more modest living, both working people that lived in the home. And then there was another one who was, the other neighbor was pretty well off as well. And every morning, this one neighbor who was sat in the middle, their house sat in between both of the other two, always was out in the garden, just like the other folks, standing to the garden, and as many of you I can imagine do so when it's not winter. And this neighbor would interact with the three neighbors with a couple on one side and the single person on the other side. Every day, he tried to communicate with them. Even if it was, how are you this morning, right? The single person who lived by themselves wouldn't really say, I'm fine, very short. See, but the difference was that in tending to the garden, the three neighbors, the one in the middle and the two on the other side, they were physically tending to their own garden. Both lived different economically, but both of them were tending to that garden with their own hands. But the other neighbor would hire a lawn care service. So when sometimes they were outside, it was because they were supervising the crew. And that neighbor didn't really interact with the other, with a couple that was two houses down. And as time went on, the years went one from here to the other. The two neighbors, side by side, interacted more and more, got to know each other. And it came time for when the couple next door, they all grew elderly, one of their children passed. And the neighbor in the middle, without being asked, went over, took him a dish like most people do when someone passes, and offered if there was anything else that he could do for them. Their response was, you being here is enough. The neighbor in the middle told the other neighbor about their child's passing, and he's like, Didn't go and say my condolences, nothing. 
And as the days went by and the weeks went by, the neighbor in the middle saw that the garden was no longer blooming like it did year after year. So he took it upon himself to go next door and try to revive some of those flowers, some of the trees, some of the bushes. And as a couple witnessed him doing this on a daily basis for several days, they felt a sort of comfort because they saw that the reflection of their garden was how they were feeling. And their neighbor coming next door and trying to help revive that also gave them that sense of comfort that they needed. Because what happens with most people when someone passes is after a few days, it's like, okay, I gave my condolences. We'll see you later. We'll see you at the next funeral. Right? Let's face it. That's reality for many folks. But this neighbor didn't care how much time had passed. So when the other neighbor on the other side lost someone in their family, no one knew about it. And grew angry with the neighbors for not being there, just like the neighbor next door had been for the other neighbor. And he grew angrier and just like, well, you know, why can't he do the same for me? See? Sometimes we look at that, right? We say, well, she's doing this for, Holly is doing that for Hannah, but she's not doing anything for me. And I'm suffering too. Okay, but have you informed Holly of what happened? She can't offer to help you if you don't tell her. And so when it came down to it, that couple who lost their child was so thankful that yes, they lost their child, and yes, that's painful hurt. But they were thankful that someone took kindness and physically implemented that into the outside. Because across the street, there had been a neighbor I don't like being a witch, where she's always looking out the window. <laughs> and I'm not trying to paint women in a bad picture before you get to that point. <laughs> but she took an interest from watching from afar on the interactions of these three neighbors over the years to where she too had gone next door and paid her condolences, her respects to that couple. And because this neighbor would talk to that neighbor a little more, she knew he had lost someone. And she too gave the condolences. And that's where that back and forth came of like, well, why is he helping me? Or why is that couple coming over and giving me the condolences? At the end of the day, the person in the middle who was well off, who could have acted like the one on, on the other side and said, well, I don't have to do my own garden because I've got enough money to do it. They still went out there to do it. Because in their garden, it produced fruit, it produced vegetables. It wasn't just your typical flowers and bushes. And so the reason they were always tending to it is because they would turn around and provide that to their community, to provide food for others. It was within them to just provide that kindness, that care, that compassion. See, in today's gospel, Jesus is saying the same thing. We get so busy, so self-involved in our lives sometimes that we don't see the other people. We don't see how our neighbor is feeling. 
But when it happens to us, we're so upset because we wore blinders and now we want them to come and help us. Now I'm not saying that that neighbor had to go over there and tend to their garden, but that neighbor could have been a little more open with dialogue, a little more communication between them. See, the neighbor across the street is kind of like God. God is always watching. God loves it when we're there for each other. Because at the end of the day, we don't take any of those material possessions. We leave them all behind. But we also know to be thankful for what we do have. Even when we've lost someone, it's hard. And there's nothing anybody can tell you to bring comfort to you because that's a personal journey that you have to be on. But we can be thankful for the small gifts. If we have extra of something, let's find a way how to provide for others. Because there's even folks who don't have much who will still share what they have. Most of you brought cupcakes today. Why? Just because you wanted to, so we can have a cupcake party afterwards? <laughs> See a couple of hits not them. No. We know that's not why you all brought cupcakes. You brought them because you know that those will go to a community that will appreciate that gift that you're giving them. Will appreciate that you have a little extra and you gave that to them. See, you're not necessarily next door to San Lucas, but San Lucas is still our neighbor. Our neighbor is anybody on this planet. Regardless of status, regardless of education, so when we provide for others because we've been blessed, you are doing exactly what Jesus has called us to do, particularly in today's gospel. You're thankful for what you do. And I'm thankful for having you as a church community. For seeing the love that you have for each other. The love that you show many times. Several, several of you thank me for being there for our needs. But at the end of the day, it was her family and God who allowed me to be in that space. And that's who I ultimately serve, is God. That's why you have me up here. That is my calling. But I will tell you one other little thing before I wrap it up, because I know some of you are like, it's taking forever. <laughs> Call it what you will. But yesterday, we were getting ready because we were going to run an errand. And for some reason, I didn't hear the church cell phone ring. And so before I leave the house, especially on a day off, I tend to look at the phone before, because I'm like, if there's something going on, that's going to have to wait. And I saw that Sharon, Arlene's daughter, had called. And I called her back. Sharon, you know that Arlene had been moved back into the hospital, into ICU. And the medical staff had already told her that there's probably not much more they could do for her except keep her comfortable. But before I called her, before I looked at the phone, I had something calling me and telling me, you haven't checked on Arlene. You haven't talked to her daughter in like a week. You need to do that. So my thought was, well, I'll call her tomorrow on Sunday when I officially start my week again. And if she's in the hospital, then I'll go see her once again. And I have to thank God for that. I have to God, 
thank the Holy Spirit for allowing you to have that understanding that God was calling me to call her daughter back. Because if I hadn't, and if I had not seen that call till later, I would have missed such a sacred moment in their lives. And I wouldn't have been able to provide that pastoral care for them at her final moments. And one thing that we discuss in there is how important church, particular spirituality, was to our name. So her children were happy that she got that final sound off. So be thankful for what we do have and count your blessings. Please join me in the new creed. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in the true man Jesus to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by his spirit. We trust him. He calls us to be his church, to celebrate his presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Seconds. Said, did you really mean to have two ministries of music? I said, yes. I did. Now you all know the song. Whenever I hear it, I think of my dad and Mr. Jess in the choir in the back of Church of the Master singing and trying to crack each other up between songs, which they were very good at. Uh, you all know it. And I'm going to sing it just as you know it. These two, however, are not, which is what makes this a little interesting. They're going to play something a little different, not real different. Do I need a microphone? Is this better? Oh, there we go.
You know, in the movies where you have that slow clapper person who's like trying to get the clapping going? That was Holly. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, you we praise and glorify, you we worship and adore, you formed the earth from chaos, you encircled the globe of air, you created fire for warmth and light. You nourished the lands with water. You molded us in your image, and with your mercy higher than the mountains, with grace deeper than the sea. You blessed the Israelites and cherished them as your own. That also we, estranged and dying, might be adopted to live in your spirit. You called us through the life and the death of Jesus. Together, as the body of Christ, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your Son, the firstborn of your new creation. We remember his life lived for others, and his death and resurrection, which renews the faith of the earth. We await his coming, when with the world made perfect through your wisdom, all of your sins, all our sins, and sorrows will be no more. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and compassionate, send upon us this meal of your Holy Spirit, whose breath revives us for life, whose fire roses us to love. Enfold in your arms all who share this holy food, nurturing us the fruits of the Spirit, that we may be a living tree, sharing your bounty with all the world. Come, Holy Spirit, holy and benevolent God, Receive our praise and petitions as Jesus received the cry of the needy and fill us with your blessing until we need no longer and bound to you in love. We feast forever in the times of the Lamb, through whom all glory and honor is yours. O God, one living, one living one, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, now and forever as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hunger no more, thirst no more. Come to the banquet of life. Holy God, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread, and after giving thanks to you, broke it, gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We give thanks to you, O God, and remember how Jesus took the cup, and after gave thanks, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of our sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Hunger no more, thirst no more. Come to the banquet of life. The body of Christ, the living bread. The new covenant, the saving cup. Sovereign God, in this meal you give us a foretaste of the great feast to come. Keep us faithful to you, that we with all your saints may at last celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, you took the form of a servant, offering yourself as food, comfort, and strength to a sick and hurting world. 
Anoint with a servant heart those who take your word in sacrament to our sisters and brothers in their homes, in prisons and in hospitals. Grant grace, mercy, healing, and hope to those who feast on your body and blood and receive your words of new life. May we all recognize that we have a place and a home in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The love surrounds you, the grace of Christ releases you, and the Holy Spirit is your guide and strength, now and forever more. Amen. As we continue to pray, let's keep in mind Deborah, Brignoli, and Bob's uh, friend, Ariana, who is having surgery on Tuesday and has a cystic, fi and has cystic fibrosis. And for all of our loved ones who are homebound, for our friends, for our church siblings who need of us, and even those who are healthy who may still be mourning the loss of a loved one or a friend, let's keep them in prayer as well this week. Loving God, who desires everyone to be healed and come to know the truth, you ask us to pray for those in positions of power, that we, we may all come together to live together, quietly and in peace and in dignity. Yet how should we pray for those who have misused that power over ours? Should we be honest in our anger and ask that their logging trucks be break down, their fishing nets tangle and their drills go blunt? Will that bring the peace you desire? Will that lead to dignity for everyone? Or would economic hardship just reach double their efforts? How should we pray for them, Lord? Should we be pious in our prayer and ask that they find peace in Christ, a deep respect for the land, care for the poor who live upon? Will that do, Lord? Will these prayers lead to the godliness you desire? For it's the godliness we desire, a quick fix, an easy solution, all provided by you and little required from us. So how should we pray for them, Lord? How should we hold the actions of others in our heart? It is not easy thing, Lord, and to hold into our hearts, perhaps even harder. It seems much to ask from us, Lord, especially from the oppressed, the bully, and maybe more than our spirits can bear. So we come asking again, Lord, how should we pray for those who have misused their power over others? How should we pray? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord, come. Be present in all negotiations, we pray, where local people sit down to tear their story, where company owners and lawyers listen and respond, where mediators and advocates intervene, where the support of aid workers is present. May the words shared among them be inspired by the word that makes all things anew, words of truth, Words of dignity, words of peace, words of love. Amen. As you know, we still are not passing the collection plate, so it would be easy to hoard all the blessings which are ours. God of this holy season, yet you call us to simply give a portion back to you so that others may be fed by your hope, children might be sheltered in warm homes, and the broken might be made whole. Receive our gifts, including our pledges, as well as our hearts, and allow this community, Christ Church, to continue its ministry. We pray in the name of Jesus, our brother. Amen. As you go from here, remember, God is always with you. No matter what you face, no matter what trials or hardships come your way, God is right beside you guiding and directing your path. So do not live in fear, but in joy, celebrating God's presence and singing God's praise. Amen. <laughs>